If you're a journalist or a historian, you're supposed to write the truth. You may have a complex concept of the truth. You may acknowledge that at any one moment there are many truths. The point, though, is that they are all truths. You can't make things up. If you're a fiction writer, you're supposed to make stuff up. And the more imaginative, the better. But these simple distinctions don't really help us make sense of the way in which we try to get at truths through social media, reality TV and film. And then there are lots of other works that raise problems too. Think of the weird hybrids like historical novels. Think of Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies by Hilary Mantel. Those books are novels. But they do implicitly claim at some level or other to be truthful, don't they? To negotiate the space between fiction and non-fiction, with me tonight are four very distinguished writers. David Shields is an American author of 13 books, including Reality Hunger, a manifesto. Da David has been hailed as the poster boy for the death of the novel and the end of copyright. Margot Jefferson is a New York-based Pulitzer Prize-winning cultural critic and lecturer and the author of books on Michael Jackson, or a book on Michael Jackson. Uh, she was a staff writer for the New York Times for 12 nope. years, oh, and her reviews that. and essays have appeared <laughs> in uh, New York magazine Vogue, Harper's and Elsewhere. Is that right? It is right. I thought you were speaking in the present tense about the Times, so, but you weren't. No, she was. Past tense was. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Truth is hard to define. It's good to see you're on your toes. I'll, I'll continue with <laughs> Doctor. Looking for truth at all times. <laughs> I think she's going to be trouble. <laughs> Dr. Jose de Lisay is uh, from the Philippines. He's an award-winning author of more than 20 books, and his work includes short story collections, plays, essays, and history manuals. He teaches English and creative writing at the University of the Philippines, and he's lectured very widely. And Helen Garner is one of Australia's best known and most successful, and I could say most loved. Shall I say that, Helen? Thank you. Most loved. <laughs> She's produced five works of fiction, four non-fiction books, two film scripts, and so many pieces of journalism. Her most recent novel is The Spare Room. That came out in 2008. And before that, non-fiction, the non-fiction work was Joe Chinque's Consolation. That was in 2004. Would you bid them welcome? David, let, let's start with you. I, I often hear writers say that people need stories. They have a need for stories, a hunger for stories. I hear that when I interview artists all the time. But do you say we have a hunger for reality? What do you mean by that? Well, I think I mean that... Um, I just want to make sure that this is caring fine. I assume it is back there. Um, I mean, first of all, of course, that children love stories... We are hardwired for story. We all love incredibly bad movies. And I would be a fool to say that we don't need stories. We obviously need stories. But I want stories that are congruent with contemporary culture. What we don't need, in my view, are works pegged toward a 19th century glacial pace that pretend there is an epistemological capital T truth that foregrounds setting and character and plot in ways that the 19th century novel did. I'm all for letting a thousand discrepancies bloom simultaneously rather than telling a single story unilaterally the way that perhaps one did in the mid 19th century. As far as a hunger for the real, I think that we live in a obviously extremely, medi extremely mediated, extremely simulated, completely artificial culture. And as, because we experience almost no reality in our actual lives, we crave the real. And so that's what I mean by, by reality hunger. I wonder who the we is in that characterization of the age. Who is this we who are so alienated from the real. Well, I think that's a good point. You're putting a good pressure on my huge generalization. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say, you know, it's a pretty large we. I would say it's, you know, uh, <clears throat> Western capitalist democracies that, you know, there's a huge number of, of people that fall into that 
that we. <laughs> let's, let, let's, get a, let's get a quick response to that. So, Margo, would you like to respond? I am inclined to agree. Um, I am part of that we. Um, I am very happy, actually, with, um, let's call them the, the old ways of telling stories, making art, but only when um, I feel that, as a critic, as a viewer, whatever, I know that they belong to their time, and I am seeing them and getting pleasure from them as the artifacts of their time. I, I want something else from, for our times, right. yes. Jose, just briefly, what's your response to this proposition? Well, I, my we would be somewhat different from, from David's and Margot's, I guess. But, but I do, uh, I, I would agree that there is a palpable need for or a desire for reality stories where I come from in the Philippines. Uh, if only because of the of the cathartic effect that, that, that reading these stories of the real, especially stories that cut to the bone, uh, produces, especially if it's someone else's bone. When you say, <laughs> when you say stories of the real, are, are you talking about stories that are based on journalism, documentary type stories, or does the, the expression stories of the real include for you novels? No, I mean, I mean journalistic uh, uh, stories, uh -huh. stories that, that have provably uh, happened. What about you, Helen? Because you, you've written fiction and non-fiction. Hmm. Uh, well, I'm actually stuck on what David said at the beginning uh, about the idea that we um, don't experience the real, if I've understood you rightly. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, but I can't... I've been sitting here thinking about gardening and thinking, yeah, well, I do actually experience real things by not watching TV all that much and, um, and planting things in, in my backyard. I mean, this probably is not germane to our subject. No, it is I, because it means you're finding ways to experience traditional, well, I I traditional reels, as you said, by not watching TV, uh -huh. for example, and by gardening. Yeah. So well, the other thing that's uh, big in my life currently is that, I've, that I live next door to my three grandchildren who are quite young, and um, there's nothing more real than the company of children, I think, seeing them sort of get, get the world. Mm. And it, it seems to me that there is a world and there is a reality, but... Um, I wonder whether Helen's impatience with television is related to your impatience with the novel. I mean, you, you said uh, of the corrections, for example, a, a novel that has been lauded around the planet. I couldn't read that book if my life depended on it. Mm -hmm. It might be a good novel or it might be a bad novel, but something has happened to my imagination which can no longer yield to the earnest embrace of novelistic form. If you say that as if this is some kind of startling observation, it seems to me self-evident. But <laughs> did, you want, me, to did you want me to explain that? Yes, further? I think so. I think, I think the, the idea that the novel has run its course, that it's no longer taking us where we need to go, if that's your proposition, I think that would be an exciting concept to unpack and perhaps to nuance if it needs to be sure. nuanced. Well, I think the novel was invented to access in interiority and now we have social media that do that there's no one under the age of 30 I know who has even the slightest notion of privacy and so <laughs> as a result all the architecture of the novel seems to me beautifully redundant you know so many novels especially novels much admired are novels that essentially have the glacial pace of, of mid-19th century novels. They, they privilege setting as if setting still mattered to us as much as they did to Balzac. Um, they often have a view of character directly derived from Freud rather than taking advantage of any understanding of, of, of character via DNA or cognitive science. They often imply some kind of godlike meaning to the universe via the 
extraordinary coherence of the world that they're depicting. And in, in so many ways, the, <clears throat> the kinds, I mean, I, I just do in, in my book, Reality Hunger, I, it's not particularly a critique of the novel. I just do some quick drive-by shootings of the novel <laughs> on my way toward trying to argue for the excitement of literary collage, of the personal essay, of uh, the essay as a uniquely exciting form yeah, for I, 21st century culture. So that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. That's the kind of form you want right. to. So anyway, I just, I, I, I do think, I mean, obviously I'm <clears throat> saying this somewhat to be provocative, but I really do feel so, so many novels that I read or try to read strike me as in all their formal gestures completely ant antiquarian, that we need an art now that is congruent with how we live now, that we don't endlessly rewrite Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was a really great symphony. It was written a very long time ago. We don't endlessly repaint Rembrandt's self-portraits. They're really great. They were painted a very long time ago that we don't endlessly remake Citizen Kane, that was made a very long time ago, and yet, in the world of, of, of literary culture, these very antiquated and highly um, kind of paint-by-numbers forms are still weirdly the default mode. And so much of, of what I'm trying to do is to reconstitute a literary culture that tries to to embody work that is expressive of contemporary culture, let's, culture circa 2012. Let's, let's go, in the course of this conversation, where you want to take us. But first of all, let's explore the novel a bit more and see whether the novel is as clapped out or as repetitive as you suggested. Jose, can we come to you? Because you are a novelist. You were jailed when you were 18. You grew up very poor. You were... Uh, you went to a, a, rich kid, a rich kid school. You've told this story often. You mm -hmm. had access to books. You had mm -hmm. access to uh, literary culture, and you became a novelist. You were jailed when you were 18. This is in 1973, at the time of mm -hmm. martial law in the Philippines. And you later wrote about that experience in an award-winning novel mm -hmm. called Killing Time in a Warm Place. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to tell such an important personal story and such an important political story in a made-up form, and perhaps if David's right, a form that is already obsolete, that belongs to a previous, de uh, previous century. Well, I chose the novel because I didn't think that my own life was still that interesting enough, and that there were many more characters and many more situations that, that I wanted to bring into the picture. Uh, but, but, but thinking about, about David's uh, 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 point here, uh, I, I, I do agree, I, I see where he's going with, with literary collage, but I'm looking at, at, at that from, from a century behind, and I think, I think I'm fairly comfortable where I am, because I've been, I've been uh, arguing back home that what we need, in fact, uh, is, is more novels, because we just haven't gone through that stage, and I wonder, how, I wonder if we should, but I mean, I, 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 do, I do believe we should, because it would be like, uh, it would be like skipping the whole industrial period before, I mean, uh, and, and going to the post-industrial without having built the, 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 the you know, the, the, the kind of, of infrastructure in our in, in our minds, in our, in our literatures, literature, that, that we need to, to deal with the issues of our time. And I, I, so I, you're persuaded by David's argument that the novel may have reached a point where it needs to be transcended. I, I think in, in, some, in some places, in some contexts, it, it, probably, it probably is the case. How fascinating. The, <laughs> the, 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 the Philippines uh, novelistic tradition does date from the 19th century, does it not? Uh, y yes, it does. But 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 it never really, it never really took off. Uh, there have been years in the study of the novel in the Philippines when there was not even a single novel written, not in English, not in Filipino. 
we, we, are, we, we have been, uh, we, have, we have run 100 meter dashes. We haven't, we're not marathoners. And we, we're very good at, at those short bursts, but I, I, I think it's about time that, that we try to see if we could make sense of our reality uh, on a larger stage, that the kind of stage that the novel, at least in my mind, provides. Helen, you've written both fiction and nonfiction, mm -hmm. and your last novel, Helen, the, the last novel that you wrote was very close to being based on your personal life, wasn't it? I mean, you always yeah, keep saying it's a novel. Yeah, it frankly was based on it something was, that really. happened. Yeah. It was really. It, it was a fine call whether it was a novel, really. Mm. Do you want me to open that can of worms? No, I don't want to open that can of worms. Yeah. I want to ask you, I want to ask you whether your um, recent works in non-fiction, and you've written a lot of them, have something to do with a frustration with the novel of a kind that David's describing. Mm. Uh, well, I do know that sometimes I pick up a novel and I open it, and when I see <coughs> characters and dialogue, I feel really bad-tempered and I just close it again. <coughs> Is that the sort of thing you're talking about? I think I'm not His sure. eyes are lighting up. I think, I, I think yes. But um, <laughs> by the same token, when I picked up uh, Hilary Mantel's book, Wolf Hall, I just thought, oh, I've died and gone to heaven before I'd got halfway down the first page and I was in a, a glory of concentration and happiness for the time it took me to read those two novels. And I, I didn't give a shit about Henry VIII until I picked up those books and, and I still don't give a shit about Henry VIII, but I, reading that book was one of the joyful experiences of my life. I can see what you mean when you're talking about the corrections. I also greatly enjoyed that, but I, I can't imagine ever going back and reading it again. But um, some, there are some things you can do in a novel that, I, that seem to me quite um, precious and valuable, and it would be a shame to, uh, you know, ditch, ditch them. But would you ever pick up a novel and read it, David, of any, of any era? Well, that's the thing. I think that Margot expressed it well. I mean, I love these works. I've read as many of them as I possibly can. I've read, I hope, in my life, thousands of novels and loved many of them. I've written three novels, and, and several of my, of, of my books walk a very delicate tightrope, I think, between the fictive and the non-fictive. So, I, you know, I love, I love a lot of novels. I've read zillions of them, I'm, and it, I, I don't want to endlessly, it's sort of a, a ridiculous point, I guess I'm trying to make in a sense, in the sense that obviously I took a plane over here from Seattle to LA to Sydney to Melbourne. Every single person on the plane was reading a big baggy novel. The novel is still very much alive, thank you very much. You know, I'm not going to, to kill it. It's, it's a very vital, form, at least in its commercial manifestations. It's, it is, though, to me, just painfully obvious for me on my own nerve endings. I'm just trying to stay alive as a writer. And I just know that for myself, I you know, was trying to write my fourth novel about 15 years ago, and I just found the whole architecture, the, the furniture moving of a novel to take me very far away from what mattered. The last novel I read that I really liked uh, is a book by Ben Lerner called Leaving the Atosha Station, which uh, the reason I like it is that it's kind of an anti-novel. It's a novel by, by default. It's essentially Ben Lerner meditating on the year that he spent in, in Madrid and using his problems of understanding the Spanish language as a metaphor for the human condition. And it's a, a, a beautiful book that is nominally a novel. Um, I basically go back to this wonderful line of David Foster Wallace's who said, who was asked, what's so great about writing? And he said, we're existentially alone on the planet. You can't know uh, what I'm thinking and feeling, and I can't know what, you, what you're thinking and feeling. And writing at its best is 
a bridge across the abyss of existential loneliness? And that just seems to me right. That's the right answer. And the books I love from, you know, Tristram Shandy to Moby Dick to Proust to J.M. Coetzee's Elizabeth Costello absolutely foreground the question of how the writers solve being alive. Some of these works fall under the broad rubric of fiction. You know, Tristram Shandy, Moby Dick, and Remembrance of Things Past are sort of, of anti-novel novels. But I do think in a post-deistic universe, which is the one that I occupy, um, I'm aware that I'm a mortal being, that I'll be dead in 50 years, and that I want to know what I and we and other human beings are doing on this planet. I'm a sort of wisdom junkie. I want sort of the knowledge now. I don't want a 700-page novel that ends up telling me that, um, you know, the narrator wants to get laid. You know, that's not, that's not a worth my 700 pages. That's a lot of novels sort of feel like that. And I think I, I'm very aware that we live in an uh, attention deficit disorder culture with me as exhibit A. And I, I, I just don't have the patience for it. And I think if we're candid about it, a lot of people don't either. And there's a kind of begrudging, false, good behavior, citizenship award for having written or read or produced or published long, big, baggy 19th century novels. They have nothing to do with how we are actually living now. Now let's, okay, now that's a quick, yes, go on. Um, I just want to put in, um, as um, a critic um, and an essayist who has never written a novel in her life um, and, and won't, and yet has loved many, um, what I, um, in, in one thing I'm very interested by here is the distinctions between we's. Um, David defined um, the post, you know, modern capitalist world um, of a we that needs certain things. Jose talked about, um, you know, the place of um, a novel, of fiction, the, its relationship to nonfiction in um, Filipino culture. Um, then there are the various eyes that we have going on. You know, there are multiple constituencies, cultural, political, ideological, aesthetic constituencies who have different needs at, at different times as history in part determines those. That has a huge effect it, it on... It does, the, yes. Now, let's, let's move to the question that is uh, underlying all of what we've got to discuss this evening, which is, can we get at the truth of things? And David, in some ways, you've already gestured towards this because you've said that you're interested in novels that that uh, take us into deep existential questions. So you're looking for answers, which are which are a kind of a kind of truth. Um, Margot, you wrote about Michael Jackson. You you researched deeply. Can you talk about the process of writing? which transforms information, truthful information, hopefully, into prose well, and what you're trying to do. What I was trying to do when I um, decided to write about um, the former genius at the time I approached it, benighted, um, Michael Jackson, I um, was trying to get First of all, I had multiple feelings about this figure, which global um, and practically transcendent as he was is, and then the mighty fall, it would appear everyone in the universe um, had. Um, but I wanted to get at what, um, at truths, possibilities, ambig at truths as ambivalences, um, contradictions, um, historical and aesthetic, fights, um, gender um, confrontations, um, racial humiliations and shames, body dysmorphia, <laughs> mask, gender, genre, you name it, um, that I felt um, ambivalent about, that I felt uncertain about, that I felt Michael Jackson I know, embodied. He embodied a, 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 a mess of cultural and historical contradictions, achievements um, and collapses. 
Um, I left out being a child star. I left out child abuse. Um, child stars, in fact, are abused by the culture. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to explore um, all of the uncertainties that surrounded Michael Jackson. Um, you say I was trying to turn research into prose. Um, I was turning not at least as much mythology um, about Michael Jackson, about, you know, we live as fans in mythologies. You know, we create these passionate, you know, um, narratives and collages around the, the stars. Um, you know, so I, I was transforming myth and longing. Uh, I was trying to transform yeah. myth and longing as well as a certain body of fact. Um, into yeah, prose. So you're, 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 you, you are and those were the truths I was looking yeah. for. So you're analyzing mythologies, aren't you? I'm but sorry, what You're did you analyzing do? mythologies, are you not? Yeah, yeah, and how facts fit into them. And how facts, you know, if you look at the fact of a preposterously damaged family like Michael Jackson's, which actually is probably no more damaged than many families we know, but they became famous. Um, you enter the family romance. You, know, you enter every Freudian, every um, Winnicottian, every, you know, you, you name it. And you, you, know, you enter the hall of mirrors of, um, you know, psychoanalysis of the horrors of the nuclear family. Now, when you say you enter this, do you mean you, you, the writer, you, Margot, yeah. enter into a kind of personal encounter? Yes. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly and what I mean. And as a writer, are you trying to capture that personal quality, the, the sense of you there with these myths, with these challenges, or are you trying to hold yourself back and say, I've got to be some kind of authoritative No, I was, frankly, I was trying to do both at different points in the book. I felt that was the approach. There is a great deal of criticism, of a critical journalism, let us say, that takes the stance of the judicious authority or the impassioned authority, but always from a kind of, as David um, said about um, a certain traditional novel, um, you know, I am the transcendent um, narrator. There are other kinds of criticism that work with um, what is my relationship? What are my bonds to this person? I felt that I was moving back and forth between um, Michael Jackson and myself and the readers, some of whom shared my attitudes, but I was also contending with readers who despised him, you know, with a mass of people who hated him, who were convinced he was a child molester, with others who said, no, he wouldn't possibly do anything like that. These were not resolvable. Um, you know, there, there was no resolvable, this is what the audience thinks, this is what I, the narrator, can think. My chance was to keep him a moving target and to remain a moving target myself. Helen, does this resonate for you? I mean, the sense of the, the relationship of the writer to the material. I'm thinking about you writing about a case like Joe Cinque's Consolation, or the more recent court case that you've been following for some years now. Uh, this, this sense of both personal engagement and, and, and yet at the same, t same time trying to... Uh, trying to step distance. back. There's a and sort of paradox here, isn't yeah, there, about sure. intimate engagement and a paradoxical distance simultaneously. Hmm. That's what criticism at its, you know, should, in, should involve, that paradox. Embraces that paradox, yeah. So you're really talking about criticism. I'll in call it, regard, let's call it cultural, cultural criticism. criticism. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Some sense of, of bringing, you know, the personal, the aesthetic, the political, the yeah. ideologically, into a relationship with each other. Yeah. May I quote this passage by Philip Roth? Or do but you wait. want to move on? I, I think I'm sorry, Helen. Helen. Sorry. Come back to Philip Roth. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I think my, my position vis-a-vis -vis the material in, in that, that, that book, Joe Chin, quite particularly, is um, uh, I didn't know how to write the book. The only way I could write the book uh, was to get into the story myself. So I'm much more in the book than what you're talking about. I mean, there's an I person walking around among the, the so-called facts of the story. Um, 
I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking me. Well, you see, I think of you as embodying this kind of paradox. I think of you, on the one hand, as someone who's intimately engaged in the story, unlike a journalist who tells herself, rightly or wrongly, that somehow she has to be detached, that yep. professionalism requires a sort of form of disengagement. Yeah. Accuracy of information, but some kind of emotional disengagement. Right. Journalists talk as though that's the job, even if that's not right. But I think of you as someone who gets in their heart and soul with lots of passion, and yet I also think of you as a kind of ruthless truth teller. Hmm. Well, there'd be no point in getting there and uh, in there and waiting around just with passion. I mean, there'd just be, you know, like what Buddhists call idiot compassion, which is <laughs> you it makes you feel good about yourself, but it's just a pain in the ass for the person you feel sorry for. Uh, it, you do have to um, well also because the, the book is about uh, on one level about the law which is a, a mighty force uh, in, in our society which at the time of writing that book I didn't really know very much about and I found I was very shocked by some of the things that were happening so in a sense that um, threw me into a position where I had to think analytically and not just go with the feelings that I had but I, I didn't experience that as a paradox, really. I don't know if that's the way it comes across. It's a struggle. It, it's a hell of a, a, a fight to, uh, to get both those, you know, both, well, to put it crudely, thinking and feeling into some kind of productive relationship. Yeah, but it, it, um, I guess it presented itself to me as a technical problem rather than a, a kind of um, um, existential one. <laughs> Are writing novels and writing these non-fiction works you do substantially different exercises for you, or are they pretty much, you know, side by side? They're not so different, no. In fact, I'm, when I first started writing, I, I, um, I've always worked pretty close to the actu to actual events and things that I experienced myself. Um, I uh, and I felt comfortable there, and I've never quite understood why. It seems to, to enrage people sometimes, but um, I sort of... <laughs> Which you've done from time to time. Yeah, but I didn't do that on purpose. You know, I, I thought, thought that I was... Uh, oh, actually, that's not true. Sometimes I did it on purpose. <laughs> Just stirring, you know. Mm. Don't let me cast the first stone. Please don't. <laughs> um, Jose, can I come to you on this issue? Because sure. you've not only written novels, you've also been involved in the production of works of history. There have been the series of history of the Philippine mm -hmm. people, which you edited. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with your own views, or your own experience, or your own passion, or your own pain, when you're writing or reviewing work, say, about Marcos and the era of martial law, when you're imprisoned? Do you try to say, oh, I mustn't bring my experience into this, or is that essential to understanding well, it's That's essential true. to understanding the, the situation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I have to drag everything that I've been through into the project. Uh, one of the most interesting projects that I took on recently was the biography of a, of a Marcus Crony, a self-described Marcus Crony, one of the biggest tycoons in Marcus's time. And he came to me and asked me to write his biography. And of course, it's the first thing I said no. Uh, but, then, but then, when I was thinking about it, the, the experience seemed so alien that, uh, or the, just, just dealing with this man, uh, for me was, was a complete challenge. And so uh, I, I took it on, uh, telling him right from the beginning that uh, he, he shouldn't expect that I would think of Marcos in the same way that he did. And, and, from, and uh, it, it, it was a very uh, worthwhile experience from the writing point of view, I think, because also from the political point of view, because I was able to bring out uh, the machinations and the intrigues within the regime that nobody, nobody had really... Uh, brought up until that point. Nobody was talking about it. And he was this insider uh, spilling his guts to me. And, and, and so I thought, I mean, that, that was a godsend. And, and I wrote the book and he was, he, even he was happy with it. 
Uh, and uh, and, it, and how did you approach that? I mean, let, let's let's go deeper into your subjectivity here. Did sure. you see it as your role to enable him to speak? Did you sort yes. of put your own view on hold and say, yes, "I'm yes. a technical facilitator of this man's voice coming out in all of its uh, colour and movement, no matter how much I may demur." Yes, uh, I mean, I, I I kept myself out of it as much as possible. Although, of course, I would ask him leading questions that would have him open up about certain things that just hadn't been, hadn't been talked about before. I, 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 I wrote much of the biography from, from his, point of, his point of view. In other words, I used, I used verbatim quotations, uh, but so, and, and that's, that's how I dealt with views I did not agree with. I mean, it, it was his story, not mine. And uh, I think even if I knew that he wasn't going to tell the absolute whole truth, at least it started a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I expected mm -hmm. serious scholars and political scientists and historians to, to jump in and to say, but that, that can't possibly be true. Or, or He's, he's leaving something out, but at least something, I mean, a, a process something had begun. Something was there, something, some truth, some truths were there, some at truth. least. I mean, the, uh, some uh, kernels. Yes, a half-filled glass, I think, is <laughs> still better than, than nothing at all. Yeah, yeah. But can I ask how, how you set it up at the beginning? Did, what agreement did you arrive at with him? Did you say to him, yeah. listen, I, let's face it, I am uh, politically opposed to uh, many of the positions and things that you took oh, I, and I, things I, that you did, but... Uh, how did you sort that out from the oh, start? I, I should clarify. I should clarify that this was a commissioned biography. Commissioned by yes, a it, publisher or by him? Uh, commissioned by him. And, and, and I should further clarify that this is something that's, that's done quite a lot in, in, in the Philippines. So there is absolutely no market for, for independent biographical work. Uh -huh. uh, but however, again, uh, uh, this was a most unlikely... Uh, unlikely pairing. And contrary to what you might expect from a Marcus Crony, I didn't get all that much, really. I just, I, I basically took the project on because it, it, it was just so, so, again, so foreign to me to, to take on something like this. And so you didn't just do it because it was a job of work. You, you're telling us you did it really with more personal engagement. For, for, both, for, both, for both reasons. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it didn't take it on uh, uh, for the money, uh, that, that was there too. But I could have, I could have done other projects yeah. uh, other than this, but this one appealed particularly to me. And, and I think uh, it, it, it came off uh, pretty well. The, the response from the media uh, was, was quite positive in that again, it, it, was, uh, it was a groundbreaking work in in, in, in many ways. Now, what you've been talking about are the different ways, Jose, in which you have tried to make sense of the history of the recent past in the Philippines. Uh, some of the projects we've touched on of yours have been novels and some have been more historical works. Do you take the view that when someone writes history, when they claim that a work is the truth, that they have a responsibility to be uh, maintain fidelity to all the facts that they have on the table? Or are there times when you can say, actually, I'm just going to ignore that fact there because that doesn't really fit in. I can tell a more illuminating story if I just move that little uncomfortable detail to the side and just let the narrative carry it where I, I think it needs to go. No, I, I'm, I think I'm pretty old-fashioned in that respect in that if, if I were to do a work of history or of creative nonfiction, then I would add adhere to, to whatever was there on the table as much as I could without, without changing anything. I think, I think the, the challenge of the thing is, is, is in working with, with what you dealt. Now, I mean, just like in poker, you, 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 whatever cards you have, that, that's what you play. I mean, I wouldn't change a Wednesday to a Tuesday just because it, it somehow made better narrative sense. I'd find a way of keeping with, with, with that particular day, but, but still find a workaround that, that would make full use of mm -hmm. that fact. Are, are you of that view? Hmm? Are you of that view, too? Uh, I, not exclusively, no. Um, I've, 
I'm, I'm very intrigued by um, those shifts and, arrange, and rearrangements, um, but I like the, the writer in some way to signal to me that that's mm -hmm. going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that, that I do want. Mm -hmm. so, you, so if we didn't know what happened on a Wednesday afternoon in the nursery, you would, you would want the author to say, let's imagine, because it could very well have unfolded something like this. It doesn't have to be built mm -hmm. into the narrative. It might be in a little introductory something yes. I've chosen to take. Yes. Lice. You know, there are, there are a lot of ways of doing it. You're nodding there. Oh, I, I'm just thinking that the way I get around that problem is, is by being in the text myself. So I can say, I don't know what happened mm -hmm. that day, yeah. Yeah. but I do but, know yeah, that... that's um, one way to do you know, it. That, yeah. That's a kind of... Um, that, that's why I think I ended up writing non-fiction with myself so forward in the text because it, it gave me the ability to um, openly shape things and say, look, now I'm shaping it this way. And if we look at it this way, it looks like that. If we look at it that way, mm -hmm. it's a different... Uh, mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, I don't want to be in there, um, you know, kicking up a lot of foam, but mm -hmm. just to... to I, I like to have some signals happening mm -hmm. too. I don't want people mm -hmm. to go, hey, wait a minute, you know, she said that yes. or she should have said right. the other. Mm -hmm. So I find it um, yes. that if there's an I in the text, I'm happy yeah. in, in that sort of, okay. I was going to say, in that suit of that's, armour. That's one mm. way, yeah. yeah. Did you have a little preface with Reality Hunger that... So I can't, I'm trying to I remember really now. No, you I didn't. didn't. I tried to make but sure that the reader... You said something, I thought, well, there's let a us know. Well, there's a disclaimer in the back of the book, which um, there's also there's a passage halfway through the book that signals to the reader. I remember there was some right. gesture that... Let, made, well, let, okay, we, we've, we've got a pact going here right. somehow. Well, yeah. we've also had a conversation now where we've ranged widely over various kinds of writing, and we've talked about the relationship between the writer, truth, imagination, trying to get at something that is illuminating of the human condition. Let's come back to you, David, because in a way we began this conversation by exploring a proposition that you floated. If, if a piece of writing merited the description realist or realistic, what would it be like if it merited the description realist or realistic? Well, I think I want to pull back a little bit and circle back to that. and. Um, is it okay if I quote this passage of Roth? Yes, I can see that you're, you're going to go home a very to... unhappy man unless you get Philip Roth off I've your chest. Dying. I'm not really a huge <laughs> Philip Roth fan, but, but this passage I really like, and I think it speaks hugely to our, our discussion. It, it's rather long, but I think it's, it's terribly germane. He says, it's from his book, American Pastoral. You fight your superficiality, your shallowness, so as to try to come at people without unreal expectations, without an overload of bias or hope, as untank-like as you can be, sans cannon and machine guns and steel plating half a foot thick. You come at them un unmenacingly on your own 10 toes instead of tearing up the turf with your caterpillar treads. Take them on with an open mind as equals, man to man as we used to say, and yet you never fail to get them wrong. You, you might as well have the brain of a tank. You get them wrong before you meet them while you're anticipating meeting them. You get them wrong while you're with them, and then you go home to tell somebody else about the meeting, and you get them all wrong again. Since the same generally goes for them with you, the whole thing is really a dazzling illusion empty of all perception, an astonishing farce of perception. And yet, what are we to do about this terribly significant business of other people, which gets bled of the significance we think it has and takes on instead a significance that is ludicrous. So ill-equipped are we all to envision 
one another's interior workings and invisible aims? Is everyone to go off and lock the door and sit secluded like the lonely writers do in a soundproof cell, summoning people out of words and then proposing that these word people are closer to the real thing than the real people that we mangle with our ignorance every day? The fact remains that getting people right is not what living is about anyway. It's getting them wrong that is living. Them, that is living. Getting them wrong and wrong and wrong, and then on careful reconsideration, getting them wrong again. <laughs> That's how we know we're alive. We're wrong. <laughs> I'd like to say that I also have copied out that very passage with a passionate feeling of gratitude and, and delight. It has I a couple of more lines. I'm I'm sorry. Like, but I'm glad that you liked it, Helen. I thought you would. It's, I love it's, it. It's, it's yeah. your work. I'll let time. you read a couple more lines, but then you must stop. <laughs> we got to. We got to. Maybe the best thing would be to forget being right or wrong about people and just go along for the ride. <laughs> But if you can do that, well, lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fantastic it passage, really and thank you for indulging me, but it's a crucial pivot, as we say, in the sense that, that I want to define not fiction, not downward, as some kind of literal transcription of the real, but rather I want to use nonfiction as a trampoline off which to bounce into asking the most serious existential questions. What's real? What's true? What's knowledge? What's memory? What's a self? How much can a self know about another self? That I, I think of nonfiction now, you know, after the fourth law of thermodynamics stated that the perceiver by his very presence alters what's perceived. I want a nonfiction that is ruthlessly and relentlessly loyal to that discovery, that we can't sort of go on and pretend that the perceiver by his very presence doesn't alter what's perceived. For instance, the book I'd love to read is Jose's book in which he hugely foregrounds his own desire to strangle the former M Marcus Crony at the same time that the Marcus Crony is giving him all this material. There, I mean, or, you know, there's plenty of examples like this. There's a wonderful book of Jean Stafford's called A Mother in History, in which she goes down to, to interview Lee Harvey Oswald's mother about L Lee Harvey Oswald, but the book is secretly about all kinds of quite internal Jean Stafford psychological mourning for her dead husband, A.J. Liebling, the boxing writer who had recently died shortly before the event. So anyway, that's my perception, and that's why the Roth quote is, is so useful to me as a way to argue for the kind of exciting things that nonfiction can do. Yes, of course, nonfiction is valuable as memoir, as journalism, as scholarship, but it's especially exciting now in a post-digital, post-God, post-modern age in which a very sophisticated nonfiction can embody our uncertainty in a way that no other form can. Now, the four of you are engaged in or participating in a conference here, and you've engaged in this conversation here tonight. Let's wind up um, by just hearing where you've come to I, uh, as a result of the conversation we've, we've had tonight, and perhaps uh, through the conference. We've, we've heard David's position. M Margot, w where is your thinking now as a, as a result of what you've been part of? Well, my, my thinking, perhaps the, um, the influence of um, just hearing a great quote, um, the line that is going through my mind um, as a kind of um, credo um, for a writer it comes from uh, Catherine Ann Porter. And the line is, there is no such thing as an exact synonym or an unmixed motive. 
<laughs> Jose? Well, I've been, I've been very much intrigued by what I've heard from, from David and, and, and privileged to hear that too because I, I feel like I've taken a peek over the horizon uh, to where nonfiction can go. Thanks. Helen? I want to read Jose's book too. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, yeah, I'd just like to know, I, I, I'm so interested in, uh, in interviewing people and what what happens between between uh, an interviewer and a subject mm -hmm. and I think that in, in your, I, I would just so love to know more about that and it's going to interest me for the rest of yes, my life that relationship I think and and all the the sort of glory of it the glory of of interviewing and trying to yes. do you find that um, one of the characteristics of interviewing people not in the kind of interviewing I do on the radio or the sort of discussion we're having now, but the kind of intimate conversation you have when someone's telling you their story, is that actually people, once they get going, really can't stop. They actually do want to talk. Yes, yes I, I think so. I think, uh, actually, when you, when you were talking, Jose, I was remembering there's a wonderful book by um, a, a writer called Gitta Sereni, which is called Into That Darkness, where she interviews at great length the... Um, the, a man called Franz Stangl, who ran the mm -hmm. Treblinka mm -hmm. concentration camp. And uh, she approaches him in jail at the beginning and says, look, I want to, I want to hear your whole life story. Mm -hmm. I loathe everything you stand for. I don't want to hear mm -hmm. any of your Nazi shit. Uh, don't tell me any of that. I just want you to tell me the story of your life. Yes. And then she says to him, um, OK, I've put this to you. Now I'm going out for lunch. I'll be back in two hours and tell me then what you think of it. And when she gets back, he's all... You know, his ties are askew and he's half in tears and, and he says, all right, I'll do it. And then the whole book is uh, an astonishing conversation um, that she has with this man. And that, that to me is uh, to, to declare at the outset that you loathe everything that a person stands for and yet to be able to listen to them with mm. openness mm. and with, with even some kind of empathy it seems to me an astonishing achievement and something that I would um, aspire to. So it requires a kind of humility, doesn't it? A humility to listen. Yeah, and an enlargement of your ability to... Um, obviously, you, you want to hate someone who's done certain things, but in front of you is a, a broken creature. Mm -hmm. It's, it's in part an act of imagination, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, I have a deep belief that we must somehow imagine what has not imagined us and what we, what in fact might want to wipe us out of existence and, you know, what in fact we would be imagined grotesquely by. But to be able to imagine that is, um, to me, uh, critical. So as a writer, you want to understand the subjectivity of your enemy? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it's, a form of a, it's a form of triumph. Oh, <laughs> it's yes. a form of triumph. Yeah. Oh, yes. In, 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 the, in the case of this man that I, that I interviewed, I, I didn't ask him about Marcos right away. I knew he would get there. Mm -hmm. I asked him about his boyhood. Mm -hmm. I, asked, I got him to relax uh, and, and tell, me, tell me pleasant stories about himself. And, and soon enough, uh, by the time we got to Marcos, many, many weeks... Later, uh, he, he could open up without feeling embarrassed by it or, or, or defensive about you it. See, now I'm wishing I could see some of these sessions filmed, you know, as you, in fact, took slow control of the entire process. <laughs> and he did, broke did you feel down. You took control? Did you feel that you were in command of it in some way? In some way, but I, uh, uh, but I always knew that it was a, a kind of a game between him and me. Mm. He knew that I was trying to get something out of him, and, and I knew that he was withholding something. Uh, it was just a matter of, of catching him at the right moment to ask uh, the right questions. Uh, and, and uh, you know... And Did he feel he had something, some wrongdoing, some... Yeah, some wrongdoing to confess to, or was he... Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes he did. And, and, uh, and he did so quite uh, boldly when, when he felt that, that he could do that. Uh, for example, he told me that, you know, back in, back in the day, comparing his time to, to the present administration, he said, 
back then, uh, we, all, uh, we all just uh, went up to, you know, to, to the president or to whoever and, and left a certain amount of money. And, and that, was, that was to be expected. But these days they go after you and ask you for so much. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, the golden years. <laughs> yes. So I got lots of stories like that and how certain decisions were made. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, again, all, all the palace intrigue. And I'm sure that, you know, that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, so many more stories need to be need But to be you told. felt that in talking to him, you were getting at the truth of the past. Well, I, was, I, was, I was nibbling away at it. <laughs> but you were uh, filling what had previously been a silence with some stuff yes. that you wanted to call the truth. Yes, and, and that's been followed up since by, by other commentators who, who know a, a whole lot more about the, the context of the thing than I do. I mean, I, I have never, I am a biographer, but I've never, I've never passed, tried to pass myself off as a historian. I, I think that, that requires more, more context more contextualizing uh, than I'm capable of. But you see, as you're talking, your, your concept of what was truthful doesn't seem to me to be that complicated. What you're doing as a person is rich and difficult, and what he's engaged in is an intense encounter. But if you get philosophical about it, it doesn't seem to me that hard to understand that what's going on here is an act of truth-telling. I, 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 would, I would suppose so, yes. Hmm. Let's, um, let's throw it open to debate. We've got some uh, microphones roaming around. It's good if you stand up, because otherwise it feels like someone's spooky in the room is just talking and we can't see who it is. Please address your question to a specific member of the panel and don't get too carried away with making enormous position statements if you don't mind. So let's uh, go down the front here. Get to one of, the, one of the ladies in the front row there. Hello, hi, uh, thanks so much for the panel. Hold it a bit closer so we can hear. How's that? Hey. Um, I wanted to return to something that Helen touched on earlier, um, a question of gender. Uh, gender, gender. And uh, in our search for the real or truth, um, things like family or looking after kids or having children, um, domesticity seems to be a kind of a end of the line really when we're talking about reality, you know. Um, there's something, you know, not much more real than, you know, maybe losing a member of your family or having a baby or... So my question is, do you think in this search for um, authenticity and the real, um, are questions of gender and maybe um, women's um, experiences um, becoming more relevant again? You mean in society or to me personally? I'm hoping you're going to say to me personally because I, I don't know how to answer that question. I, it just seems to me, I, I kind of get puzzled when, I, I know this, this sense that there is, that everything's fake now. I mean, that we're walking around in these, in, in the world, everything is um, layered, there's layer after layer of stuff happening. And it's just, you get this, when I first heard the, the title of David's book, Reality Hunger, I instantly knew what it, well, I assumed, that it must be about that sensation of being kind of padded. There's this padding between uh, us now and w what we imagine to be the real. And th that's why, you know, in my helplessness in the in the face of this, I there just seem to be certain crude, simple facts of, of being physically alive in the world. And I kind of hang on to those. And I want to sort of honour them and use them. And just, um, I mean, I kept thinking about gardening and, and, and just the, the sort of crude physicality of gardening and how you have to learn to, um, in a sense, once again, be humble before that. You know, just the fact of the seasons or the fact that uh, you've got to 
put compost in or mm. whatever, and you've got to plant the tomato at the right time of year. And I get a great deal of satisfaction, a very deep satisfaction out of, and I'm no good at it. I can grow broad beans, I can grow basil, and I can grow tomatoes. I know how to do that. Mm. So I've got this well, tiny, well, I've got this tiny chink of um, through this padding, and I know how to get through there. And I know that if there's a kid around, I feel better. But but it, it's a kind of pretty desperate. <laughs> well, modest, not desperate. Yeah. Let's. Um, can I have some hands so I can see? Okay, there's one over, over here. Hi. Um, I guess I have a question about. A bit closer to your mouth. Sorry. I have a question about when you're writing something that has occurred whether you're involved in what has occurred or whether you're being told the story of what has occurred and you're now writing that story. If you are, if from your perspective, you can see a truth that you know someone in the story does not hold to be true, how do you write about it? Do you feel a moral dilemma about that person or about that character? Can I interrupt you? Are you imagining this is a non-fiction work or a work of fiction? Either. How do you get around that dilemma that you can see a truth or you have analysed a truth or you have been told a truth that you know someone in that story doesn't believe to be true? How do you get around that? Or how do you write to that? Anyone want to have a go at that? Can I read a passage of... No. Um, <laughs> but I, I joke because I care, and that is the raw thing couldn't be more relevant in the sense that that sounds... If I think I yeah. heard what you were saying, that, that you, the author, narrator, speaker, wants to tell a story about, say, several people, and one of them is telling a story that that person knows to be untrue, is that right? No, oh, that it, the author the author knows is untrue. Yeah, but the author knows that someone involved in the story doesn't hold the same Right. I see. Well, I would say, you know, welcome to the terror dome. This is called this is inter this is interesting work. You know, like you think of of Mary McCarthy's wonderful book, Memories of a Catholic mm. Girlhood. You think of Jeff Dyer's Out of Sheer Rage. Oh, yeah. You think of Lauren Slater's book, Lying, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a metaphorical memoir. I mean, so many of the works that I love the most and that I try to read and teach and try to write myself are works that make truth a very elusive target. And so the idea that there is one person in the story who says something isn't true, etc., that is when, the, to me, a work of so-called nonfiction gets really interesting. Yeah, I couldn't agree and more. And so for me, yeah. hello, welcome to the party. You know, that's where it gets interesting. And so I would say, you know, as we say in America, you know, bring it on, you know. Yes. <laughs> and then it becomes a question of, of, of strategy and technique. Right. Yeah, you know, how, right. yep. how are you going to right. render mm -hmm. that? That's, that's where it gets in, writing gets interesting, isn't mm -hmm. it? Where you've got to invent a way of mm -hmm. encompassing that as a, those technical problems. And it's kind of technical, mm -hmm. as yeah. you said, to some extent. And that's when you really get a thrill. Because you've got to move these great chunks of stuff mm -hmm. around and you've got to knit them and juggle them and it's wonderful. Mm. <laughs> Let's, uh, the, the, the girl, sorry, the girl in the yellow cardigan in the second row has been excited for a while. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask the panel about um, that idea of authority and just uh, approaching it from a couple of um, problems, I suppose. The first is um, um, the problem that migrant uh, sorry, writers from migrant experiences have. Um, I know that in the UK and the US there's quite a, you know, a huge tradition of um, writers speaking from migrant experiences. Um, I kind of sort of feel that myself, and I've got this insider-outsider problem where when people know that I'm Filipino, I'm asked to write about 
Philippine politics, and then I write it, and then readers in the Philippines say I'm out of touch. So, you know, so there's that problem of, of authority, and I'm just wondering whether you have a comment on that. But the other problem, in case the panelists might not be able to dip into that problem, the other problem is that idea of um, authority being diffused now, you know, with technology um, and, you know, with e-books and bloggers and what have you, authority has been diffused now. So for, for younger writers, how do, you, how do you source authority in the way you write? Like, where would that emerge? Do you want to go with that, Jose? How do you, you how do you establish your authority? Well, I'm not sure that people back home uh, understand the situation all that well either. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and sometimes it takes a view from the outside to to show the obvious. Uh, but I know I know the problems there that you 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 refer to. Uh, like when I was doing my MFA at Michigan, everybody expected me to write about, you know, coconuts and <laughs> things like that, and they were happy with that. Coconuts, death, murder, I mean, um, uh, you know, political stuff. And the minute that I did something vaguely suburban, you know, all, all the interest just dissipated. Uh, and I had to explain to them that there's, there's Filipino suburbia, too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we do, of course, tend to get exoticized, and even, even political literature uh, uh, of the kind that I've been talking about all day can also get exo exoticized, uh, as if, as if you, halo, you had a halo around your head, if, if, you, if you spoke about political violence and, and, and all that, and I think that that we should also be, be mindful of that and also make it a point in, in conferences like this, in, in our little session on, on, on Philippine nonfiction this afternoon, for example, to, to bring up the fact that, that uh, I mean, the Philippines isn't all that, uh, that we are a, a, a lovely, a beautiful country in, 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 in many of the respects in that, uh, you know, that there's peace and prosperity in many, in many parts of the country. But it just, it's just such a sad thing that we have to deal with all this other stuff that we've inherited from, you know, centuries of being who we are and, and what we've been through. Uh, I would think that, that your authority, if, if that's what you're thinking about, should, should emanate from who and what you are, where you are right now as, as, a, as, a, as a Filipino Australian. I, I tell my, my, my Filipino-American friends that, that you know, I, I think it's, it's your privilege to, to speak from that experience. I can't speak to that. You, you are where you are. And, and, and it, it's that very hybridity that, that gives you power. Yes. I, Annie, I would me. like actually to add to that because I obviously cannot speak um, from a Filipino Australian position, but as um, you know, a, a black American, I say African American, black American, Negro American when I was growing up, living in the U.S., I, um, I, know I have always navigated um, from the beginning of my professional life between um, internal and external expectations about what my cultural, ra racial, you know, social, political resume said I ought to do. Um, when I first, my first writing job was at Newsweek and I went there in the 70s and I personally wanted very much to write about um, all kinds of works by women, everything that I felt had been overlooked, and not only works by blacks, but works by people of color that my colleagues had not been and were not um, reviewing. Um, but I also, quite frankly, to put it crudely, knew that I had no desire, and that was in terms of you know my own personal tastes and aesthetics, um, to be the person, the go-to only, the go -to person only for <laughs> that work. Um, that was not going to happen because that was false to who I was and what I wanted to be. I wanted the right, and that goes back to my 
feeling that you can imagine and live with and, you know, study whatever the hell you want. Um, if I wanted to write about F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, damned if yes. I wasn't going to do it um, mm -hmm. and find my way through. I, Jose is right about the, the strength of hybridity, variety, and of also not yourself letting the, the very fixed narratives mm. of what your I, cultural identity or aesthetic identity is. Nothing is closed off to you. Yes. I mean, people want it to be, mm. um, you know, but you know, whenever you find yourself taking for granted some definition, some construction of what you are to be doing, find a way around it. Margot, in any through. piece of writing where you hold yourself out I as a truth, when you hold yourself out as a truth teller in any piece of writing, you do have to establish a kind of authoritative voice. You have to say to the listener, trust me, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, that's if, true. if I tell you something is the case, it will be as far as I can make it truthful. Truthful. If, yes, if I, though, if I but again, an argument. truth in, for example, truth in critical writing, as with truth um, in poetry okay, or fiction, honest, often honest. has to do with how you are rendering in a very intimate way your sensory responses, your opinions. These are very personal and so, private so things, honest. so they have to take on a form of truth that is not necessarily factual. No, so honest is a better word. Pardon? I'm suggesting yes. that honest might be a better yes. word. You're being yes, honest. yes. Um, and not working with a lot of um, hidden agendas that are being covered by critical discourse. You know, ev every field has its discourse. You know, you say, you say, that's awfully melodramatic. And suddenly all the possibilities of melodrama because of that mm. qualifier disappear. That's very mm. polemical. Yes. You know? Um, some of the greatest works yes. in, in the literature are polemical. Yeah. Yes. So it's, you know, it's those unacknowledged restrictions um, that language often imposes. Just got time for a couple more. Let's, uh, oh, there's a very keen question there. Thanks, uh, uh, David. I was just interested in the Bring notion, it right up near your mouth because the we notion can't of hear. reality hunger and um, is reality hunger suggesting that reality is out there to be found? Um, and if not, is your view that um, our hunger can never be satisfied? <laughs> I think I heard the question to be: Is is reality out there with sort of a capital R? And um, is if not, then is the hunger never satiated? Is yeah. that a fair summary? <laughs> yep. The hunger. Um, I guess I have sort of easy, quick answers to that. Yeah, there is no capital R reality out there to find, and yes, our hunger will, will never be satiated. <laughs> I mean, I can, I've written a book, I've written another book about this very phenomenon, but yeah, I mean, that captures it well. I mean, I don't, some, I mean, some, there were some Catholic blogs that thought I was talking about reality with a capital R and that I was talking about God in that book or something like that. Or that um, but, I mean, yeah, I think that's the key. I mean, going back uh, again to, to what I'm interested in personally is using the essay form, using nonfiction with a strong pressure on the word non that I'm terribly interested in trying to get to reality in all likelihood, probably not getting there, but in in trying to get there, getting deeper and deeper purchase on understanding what we're doing on the planet. So yeah, I think you've you've summarized well a book that that took me five years to write. But you've summarized it, <laughs> you've summarized it, it well in about seventeen words. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. We'll have one more question. Let's go from this side. Oh, she was quick. Um, it's just a two-part question for David. I was interested in what you said tonight about... Can you speak more slowly and more clearly? Uh, sorry. Uh, a two-part question for David. I was interested in what you were saying tonight about um, we can't find fact in our fiction in the West anymore. Well, that's your opinion. But you said that you came to that conclusion as a writer, not as a reader, initially. So I was wondering if perhaps you could just expand a bit about your attempt to write a novel finding that you couldn't find truth in it anymore, and have you tried to write that novel since um, that you've envisaged this new novel that will find the truth? I think I got that one. 
to my American ear, sometimes an Australian question eludes my grasp slightly, but I think the basic question was that, uh, you know, that I, had, I, I was working on a novel the, and it, it, it didn't quite come together and then I sort of segued into nonfiction and, and then, I'm sorry, and then the, the core of the question would be, Right. Yeah, I, that's all terribly interesting stuff. Um, I think, you know, I basically, as I said, I sort of just sort of flashing my bona fides a little bit. You know, I, I, I had written three novels, a pretty traditional novel, a book called Heroes, uh, a somewhat less traditional novel, a, a buildings roman, dead, dead languages, and then a novel in stories, which sort of hovers between the essay and, and fiction. And then I was trying to write my fourth novel, a book called Remote. I was trying to write about uh, a couple and the way they were both obsessed with television and film and they were defining each other and themselves against sort of media standards. And I just could not get this novelistic material to work as novel and that book broke down and I ended up writing dozens of digressions and the, the digressions to my enormous relief became the book itself and it became a book called Remote Reflections on Life in the Shadow of Celebrity. And I guess sort of somewhat grandiosely, I've taken my humble little experience of, of trying to write my fourth novel and not being able to write it and I've developed this grand theory of the culture that, <laughs> that for me, you know, I couldn't write my fourth novel so I've declared you know, <laughs> rather like the Marcos regime, you know, I've just declared, okay, I couldn't do it, so the novel is dead. And, um, you know, certainly more than one reviewer has pointed out that fact to me. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm well aware of the grandiosity of it, but it, it's simply, I mean, that book, Reality Hunger, wouldn't have generated anything like the conversation and controversy. It didn't if it didn't on some level punch people's buttons in a, a fairly serious way. And so um, I think all that we as nonfiction writers, as, as essayists, can do is enormously trust our own nerve endings. I just trusted my nerve endings. I knew in my, to, my, to the bottom of my bones that the novel as a form felt dead to me. And I simply trusted that feeling and 15 years later, I wrote a book, Reality Hunger, a manifesto, which has got, I think it's fair to say, you know, some traction in the culture. It's a book that people like to argue with, against, for. At the, the very least, you could say it has, has, has generated some conversation. But, um, you know, I think that, um, just to answer your question finally, that <clears throat> what to say that after that book, I have not written a novel per se, although I would argue heavily that a lot of, my wife and daughter think everything I've written since has been fiction, to be honest. They think like, come on, you make up so much in your supposed works of, of nonfiction that those are not called novels because they don't have plots and invented characters, but they are, are hugely, I take enormous poetic license. So it's not so much as I've quit writing fiction as I've quit calling it writing fiction. <laughs> I'm interested in a terribly pliable nonfiction frame, and I think that is where the most exciting contemporary nonfictional work well, that's is taking place. <laughs> That's all we have time for in our search for the art of truth. Would we join me in thanking our panelists, David Shields, Helen Garner, Margot Jefferson, and Jose Delisai.